Hi, my name is Fede and this is Eternally Curious. Today I'm going to talk about something very controversial. Some scientists believe that today we have the technology and the power to change the Earth's climate, but not accidentally. I'm talking about the deliberate large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment. Now, this plan is controversial and audacious and could be very dangerous. It's called geoengineering, a very scary word for a lot of people. Is this a good idea? Or is it a terrible idea? What's the risk of doing it? And what's the risk of not doing it? Could this technology save humanity or destroy it? Let's find out. So on, on solar geoengineering, I would say for the last, certainly four or five years, that's really been the main focus. This is David Keith, professor of applied physics and one of the leading researchers in the field. He's been studying the Earth's climate for decades. And now with his team at Harvard, he's looking into a particular kind of technology, solar radiation management. One idea is to get a big fleet of airplanes to go up in the stratosphere, spray aerosols, which then reflect the sun's rays into space, which cools the planet down. If this idea sounds completely insane to you, you're not alone. A YouTube search on geoengineering or stratospheric aerosols gives back videos with millions of views which suggest a global conspiracy of evil scientists who act in secret and have a hidden malignant agenda. The problem with these videos is they don't go to the source. Instead of going off wild speculations, I ask directly to the researchers. Here's a scenario. Let's say we wanted to cut the rate of warming in half over this century. So this is assuming that we're working hard to cut emissions and that we gradually bring emissions to zero, say sometime around 2070. But there's but, but before then, emissions are steadily rising. So what we want to do is reduce the rate of warming. And to do that, what you want to do is steadily increase slowly the amount of aerosol geoengineering that you're doing. So the amount of, say, sulfate aerosols or something else you're putting in the stratosphere. If you started, say, in 2020 or 2025, very soon, you would certainly start with sulfates because we know with real confidence that in some gross sense they will work. Not that there aren't lots of risks or uncertainties, but we know we can make the radiative forcing, and we know that with small amounts the risks aren't that big. So what you would do is start with maybe uh, the first year you did it, something like 20,000 tons of sulfate, of sulfur in, in the form of sulfate, and then the next year you have to do 40,000 and you'd be working your way up. And after about 50 years, say by 2070, you'd be something around one or two million tons a year of sulfur. That would be the amount required to have cut the rate of warming in half all the way out till 2070. You put sulfur in the stratosphere, then after a couple of years, what happens? It rains down? Yes. As sulfuric so acid? It... That's right. It rains down as sulfuric acid. This might be a cause of concern. An obvious question is what are the health consequences of that sulfur we put in the stratosphere? Working with Sebastian and his, his advisor, who's a sort of expert on health effects of, of high altitude sulfur emissions from airplanes. For every ton of sulfur that we put in the upper atmosphere, the health impacts on the ground are about 26 times less than putting that same ton in the lower atmosphere with the current distribution of sulfur sources. And that's partly because for the sulfur to get down from the upper atmosphere to the lower atmosphere, it all ends up getting down, but most of it ends up getting caught in raindrops and rained out. And also it, it's distributed globally, not more where people are as our current pollution is. And then there's the fact that we need about 50 times less sulfur in the upper atmosphere to get the same cooling effect as a given amount of lower atmosphere. So the net effect is that if you want to use sulfur to cool the climate, it's something like maybe a thousand times less risky to put it in the upper atmosphere than the lower atmosphere. That it's 50 times more reflective than in the yeah. lower. So for every 50 molecules of sulfur that we take out from the pollution, we could put yep. one in the upper stratosphere. That's, that's exactly right. And that's basically actually not mostly, it's partly a, a difference in reflectivity, but it's mostly simply lifetime. Uh, it's, it's as simple as this. More or less, there's a, a sulfur in the lower atmosphere that lasts for a week or two, and in the stratosphere it lasts for a year or two, and there's 50 weeks in a year. So more or less, that's the 50 to one ratio. Putting two million tons of sulfur in the atmosphere could cause thousands of deaths per year. So why would we even consider doing such a crazy thing? Of course, the one other big factor is that we are already today putting about 50 million tons of sulfur in the lower atmosphere as pollution. And that pollution kills maybe three or six million people globally from air pollution. 
and it already is cooling the planet by something like in the units we use a watt per square meter or so. So I personally would like us to very quickly reduce that sulfur air pollution because it's awful and kills people. And so maybe if in my scenario, if I was czar, we would reduce that air pollution over the next 20 years or so. So the people in you know, China and Malaysia and other places with air pollution live longer, live better lives. And if you do that, you'd want to increase the amount of solar geoengineering more quickly to avoid the warming we would otherwise get by removing the cooling that is coming from our current pollution. Even if you accepted everything I just said, you might say, well, yeah, fine, David, but nobody's ever put this kind of stuff in the stratosphere. We have no idea what will happen. Well, in my scenario, I ramped up to about one or two million tons a year of sulfur, say by 2070. And as a comparison, the big volcano, Pinatubo, that went off in the early 1990s, it put eight million tons in in a single year. So that under the scenario I said, even after 70 years, which would be the peak, because if emissions had gone to zero at that point, after that you would stop increasing solar geoengineering and you gradually decrease it. So under that scenario, in that peaking at two watts per square meter or so, at two or three million tons a year of sulfur, you'd still have a lot less each year than a big volcano. And the big volcano didn't produce horrific results. That is, the ozone layer was decreased in ways we understand roughly, and there were impacts, but there was not giant impacts. And that gives me some empirical confidence that the kind of unknown unknowns aren't that bad. It doesn't prove it, but it gives you a lot of confidence that we'll still be several times less than what nature has done uh, in a way that, that is in the range of what our models and observations uh, um, can, can see with some sense. So, so while the taboo is breaking and there are now hundreds of papers published, there's still very little in the way of focused research. So there are no significant government programs that aim to actually figure out how to improve these technologies or reduce the risks. And in general, there's actually almost no organized government funded research at all. So what's happening is people who are climate modelers and care about this are kind of diverting work to kind of rerun climate models. Our group is doing some of that as well. But we are also working uh, uh, in two other domains. One is to try and figure out how to actually make the technology perhaps less risky. And so, for example, we're investigating the possibility of, um, of alternative aerosols other than, say, sulfates in the stratosphere that might pose less risk. And we've got a bunch of work on that, all laboratory work, but we're also looking at doing field experiments. So like diamonds and alumina, those are some of yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, most interestingly, probably actually the idea that we could add a base to the stratosphere that can counteract the acids that cause um, loss of ozone. And it looks in preliminary models, and you know, we have a paper under review, that uh, you could actually um, reverse ozone loss at the same time as you did solar geoengineering. So you could <clears throat> do this in a way that you would say, cool the planet a little bit, but instead of damaging the ozone layer further, you'd actually heal the ozone layer by removing the effect of some of the uh, chlorine that humans have put there by, um, by chlorofluorocarbons. How much more research um, do you think is needed before we can establish if this technology is sound and safe and should or shouldn't be used? I think we need at least a decade of a coordinated international open access research program that really is broad, that includes a suite of field experiments before even in a narrow technical sense we are, in my judgment, ready to talk seriously about decisions around implementation. At this point, you might be concerned. Messing with the Earth's climate is not something to be taken lightly. I've spoken with other researchers and experts, and they have conflicting views on this technology. But everyone I spoke to agrees on the following. So right now, I don't think we know enough about these technologies that it would make sense to use them. So if you asked me to make a decision now about whether we should do solar geoengineering at large scale or forget it forever, I think I'd choose forget it forever. The first job is, is the same job we have anyway, which is cutting emissions. That's the bottom line. If solar geoengineering is safe and it works, and that's a big if, it wouldn't fix climate change. It may give us a bit more time to adapt, but it doesn't fix the concentration of CO2 in the air. Ocean acidification and other problems would still be there. Cutting emissions remains first priority, no matter what. And we could even go further, removing carbon from the air and storing it in the ground. But that's for another video. Thank you for watching. 
Over the past few months, I've studied climate change and geoengineering, and I've collected many hours of material with interviews with experts. If you're interested in going deep and want to know more, let me know in the comments, so I'll make more videos on that. I would like to thank the Google Making and Science team for supporting this project and for the Science Goals Initiative. If you want to get notified of the new videos that I make, click here to subscribe to the channel. If you want to see my other Eternally Curious videos, I have a playlist right here with all of them. And if you really like what I do and can support me, you can do it here on Patreon. Thank you for being curious.